Welcome to the Investor Coaching Show, a podcast to help you get an insider's view of the financial world and escape common investment traps. And here's your host, Paul Winkler. And, uh, you know, I, I just thought it would be You just came back. You were out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. On vacation. It was nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, so you just traveled, got away from everything. Do you find it's, you know, I, I often talk about how refreshing that is just to get away and just disappear. Oh, it really is. I mean, you, you get so wrapped up in life day to day uh, that when you get away and you kind of disconnect and you don't mm -hmm. look at your phone every five minutes and you're not checking your emails all the time and, and everything that you, you really get a sense of coming back to who you are. You know, it's, it's, we're so enthralled in, in, you know, our day-to-day -day lives, when you yeah. get away from that, you know, it, it lets you discover who you really are again. Oh, that's an interesting, that's an interesting insight because, and that's part of the reason I thought, hey, I would love to bring you on and just talk <laughs> about this stuff because right now it just seems like there's this sense of uh, people, anxiety, Oh yeah, lots of it. I, I think lots in, of it, in yeah. so many different ways. Yeah, the the one thing that that I, I guess I gathered from you know well this year you know we were gone for a week but uh -huh. last year we did a two week trip to Colorado, and what I really realized is that there are two Chads. There's there's everyday Chad mm -hmm. who has a job you mm -hmm. know and comes in here, love what I do and everything, but that's not who I am. Right. You know, and there's the there's then there's the real Chad, and that's who I rediscover when I when I disconnect and get away from everything. That's cool. And every once in a while, going back and forth. Yeah. You know, yeah, between absolutely. the two. Yeah, it's a balance. It's refreshing. Yeah, and it's funny because I talk about how you know the thing I was talking about recently, the three day effect. Yeah. Where people just get out and they get away from everything, and then first couple of days great, third day I say it's magical. And the reason it's magical is because what we tend to do is through the every day, the, uh, the anxiety and kind of the uh, you know, day to day stress of life, uh, we find that your brain is not able to actually do as much and, and people aren't able to, they use memorizing a string of numbers as the way they did it. Right. They're not able to recall as well. Uh, maybe recall information as well. You know, it's not on the tip of your tongue. A lot of things you just, it, it can be frustrating where you don't remember sure. certain things that you know you need to remember. And then also what happens is our ability to create new things and be creative goes away as, as time goes by. And I had a friend that always used to tell me two weeks per quarter. He said, Paul, go take two weeks per quarter. And the reason he would do that is because he says people hire you for your ideas, your uh, you know your your creativity, your enthusiasm, and they don't get any of that if you don't take some time away. Right. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of people get into retirement, and that's what I want to talk a little bit about. Is you've been dealing with a lot of people in retirement, and typically, what do you find when people are looking at getting into those years when they retire? Do you find that they're typically looking forward to it or they have kind of some kind of a dread concern about what it's going to be like? I don't. Occasionally, we run, I run across somebody that may have a little dread about it, you know, and a little anxiety about mm -hmm. what it's going to be like and everything. Um, I've got some people that are just, you know, they can't wait for that day. They've got it planned out and, you know, they've done all the work and here we go. We finally get to do this and everything. And then. And do the, they, do they typically, do you typically find that once they do it, once they cut ties, that they find any regret or worry about their decision? Those people know. Those people know. The ones that have done planning the don't. The ones That's that have really planned and prepared. And that they, not only have they planned financially, but they've planned for what their life's going to be like after oh, retirement. Oh, okay. You know, so they, they have a, a focus and a purpose and things that they want to do and all. Um, 
then there's a third group of people and the third group of people are the people who they're not really anxious about retirement they may have prepared financially and everything Uh um but they're i guess anxious about pulling the trigger because what they've always done is worked right and it's not that they're worried about their financial future it's just i think they're worried about what are they going to do so there's two types of planning yeah the two types of planning is number one you got to prepare financially you Mm -hmm. can't just quit and not have anything and just go out on a whim and and hope that it works out uh but you also have to prepare yourself and plan uh mentally and you know what are you going to what's your day going to look like what do you want to accomplish and much like you do you know through you know you start a job you know as an entry level well you know 40 years ago well 40 years later you don't want to be doing the same thing that you were doing you had a plan and you progressed through that plan right you know throughout your life so when you do stop working in retirement you need to have a plan of what day-to-day life's going to look like what do you want to accomplish you know what are your goals so you actually find that people do engage you in that conversation some people do yes yeah yeah, yeah. and i would say it's probably probably close to 50 percent wow you know have an idea of what they want retirement to look like then there's probably you know you know a a fair amount 25 30 percent that just want to retire but they haven't planned what it's going to look like after that day comes Uh and then then you've got you know the remainder of the people who uh you know who uh they just not sure they're ready to retire probably because they don't have a plan for the future not necessarily financially but mentally and physically do a lot of people do you find that they actually get into consulting after work um yeah people in um you know higher level positions uh people who are have an expertise in a field uh you know have a skill set that is you know in high demand uh uh-huh. will do consulting we have several clients that do that and uh it kind of keeps them engaged in in the mm-hmm. in the workforce and keeps them social with people that they may have worked with before keeps them uh you know a a goal of striving to stay up to date on you know what they spent their lives their right. past lives doing you know up to this point uh so it, it kind of gives them you know a uh, let's say a kind of easing into right, retirement right, right. And, and what i find chad is that people worry that they're really going to affect their social security negatively if they ease in if they don't take their social security right away right yeah and, and social security really isn't a factor in that i um, mean you know as far as you know do I keep working, you know, to boost my Social Security? Well, you know, the, the way Social Security is structured, you know, working another year or two, unless you have zeros in your work history, really not going to help your benefit, increase your benefit that much. The, the main factor in your Social Security is when you actually file for it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Now, th- and I think that people equate that with pensions, because if you have a pension, you might actually find that it might be based on a highest three years of income formula right or a f- highest five years or something like that and if you have a few years where your income goes way down and you're working for the same company especially yeah then you have a problem on your hands social security is actually based on 35 years right of data yeah and they look back and, and what chad was basically saying with zeros if you have a bunch of zeros so let's say if you look back at your last 35 years or uh, 35 highest years and maybe you have 30 years of work history and the rest of it you don't have any work history so you'll have you know five zeros in that particular case will be factored in and then you go forward further and you actually have some income well you're replacing those zeros you they're not looking at your highest five years so anything would be better so a lot of ways sometimes the way you actually do this is you can actually go on social security if you've never done this set up an account ssa.gov and then what you do once you get in there you can it will tell you they assume that your income is going to continue as it has been the past few years right they're going to it's assuming that your income is going to continue and in this particular instance what you're doing is you're saying hey, I can actually play around with this and I can take the income history and I can replace the zeros. 
You know, I can actually do something a little bit different and see how it's actually going to affect Social Security. And what if? Right. That type of thing. Positively or negatively. You know, yeah. you know, you may have a situation where a client has prepared financially to retire and everything, but they're concerned about retiring early because mm. they think it's going to substantially negatively affect their Social Security. So, you know, right. you can also look at it in the reverse situation. Uh, just going back a little bit to what you were yeah. saying a few seconds ago, I think a lot of people that haven't been through the planning process and Social Security planning and all just assume that the day you retire is the day you take Social Security. Right. So right. it has, you know, they have that effect of, well, if, you know, if I quit work now and I take Social Security now, well, you know, those two things don't have to go hand in hand. Right, right. How do you like doing planning in general? Just walk back and step back and go, so typically first step of planning process, and I don't talk about this a whole lot, but it would kind of be fun as a guy that's in the trenches every single day <laughs> doing planning. How do you typically do the planning? Well, basically, my first step with anybody, of course, is to, you know, set the groundwork, the framework of, you know, what we do, how we do mm -hmm. things uh, and the, the logic behind that. But then the next step is to naturally gather the information. I mean, if you don't know, you know, all of their information, uh, you can't really put a plan together. But I think another important factor, just as important as that is, what are their goals? Mm -hmm. You know, what do they want the future to look like? When do they want to retire? You know, you may have, I would like to retire here, but realistically, I think I'm going to retire here. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes this one works out. Sometimes the earlier one works out. I was it's just, just going to say, a lot of people don't know what's possible. Exactly, exactly. And until because you gather all Because they don't know what they that, don't know. Yeah, if, if I don't know what your goals are and I don't know what you have, there's no way I can put a plan together for you. So anybody that, you know, is, is telling you that, you know, trying to sell you a product or something that's going to guarantee your future without knowing any of these other mm -hmm. details is trying to sell you something. You right, know, they're right, they're right. not putting together a plan. So planning is is the key, and that, the clients that I work with, that I find, I won't say are most successful in retirement, but are most satisfied and happy in retirement, are the ones that have planned, both financially and mentally and physically for what retirement's going to look like. So I think it's a it's a two part thing. You you can't do one without the other and have the optimum success. Yeah, so one of the things I, I wanna talk about is I wanna get really granular okay. on what the planning process looks like with you. Okay. You know, so let's do that. I wanna take a quick break and be back and say, okay, so exactly what do you expect and what does it look like? What things do you look at? Look at? What things do you prepare? What do you put together? What are the things that you gather and get together in order to do planning and why? and just how that looks. So okay. let's do this. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back after this on the Investor Coaching Show. Paul Winkler, Chad Henson. Be back right after this. Hey, we are back here on the Investor Coaching Show. Paul Winkler from Chad Henson. Doing a little bit of a walkthrough on what financial planning looks like, what it really is. I, I remember back when uh, Chad, when we did it, in the early days, working for the big investment firm, you walked in and we used to do what was called financial needs analysis, FNA. That was before, <laughs> thankfully before your time, before you did this <laughs> stuff, because this is going back 30, uh, 33, year, oh my goodness, a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but we would go through and because it was, the idea was try to sell life insurance. Right. It would be, you know, if something happens to you, you're going to have to have, uh, let's say, you got to have somebody pay, pay the funeral expenses. Do you want the house paid off if something happens to you? Right. Uh, well, how much debt do you have? How old are your kids? Let's back up and say how much we want to have for college education. Uh, and, you know, we would go through that. Sure. And then we would figure out, okay, well, you need... And it always came out to literally the eight to 10 times income. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Which is pretty heard much. Heard that my whole life. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's where it comes from. I mean, literally, we would go through that process with people with young kids. And, and it, it, people are pretty similar in the size house they tend to buy as a percentage of their income that they make in mortgage payments. 
Right. I saw something yesterday. I, I'm curious what you say as this, but somebody had actually had a, a pie chart, and uh, somebody sent me the pie chart and said, do you agree with this? And it was 20... No, it was 35% of income, of your income, is what's acceptable for housing, mortgage payments. That's awfully high. Yeah, that's, that's what for I thought. For a mortgage payment. Now, if you're talking about housing, which would be mortgage payments, property taxes, insurance, utilities, okay, I can go with that. But if, My, if your house payment's 35% of your income, yeah. you're going to have a tough time. Yeah, I, I thought it was, a, it, that, that, that's where I was as well. And it was something like 10% of your income could be for debt servicing. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. Uh, granted, if you're just out of college and you basically have a, you know, a student loan. Right. Maybe. But for most people, you try to get that to, to next to nothing. Exactly. Uh, so that was one thing. Then they had savings for future was just 10. And I typically try to go. Yeah, you start at 10 right. and you try to inch it up from there. Sure. But if you're paying 35% in a mortgage... Mm -hmm. It's going to be tough to save 10. <laughs> well, sure, sure. So if you were to look at the things that you have people put together to do a financial plan, what would be those items that would be on a checklist of things that they bring in right away? Sure. Um, so we are we do like holistic planning. So we look at everything, not just mm -hmm. you know your investments. But things that you would bring in would be, of course, any financial statements you have from like, you know, workplace retirement plans, uh, bank accounts. Okay, so 401ks, 403bs, statements that you have, old and new. Mm -hmm. um, you I, know, IRAs. Savings accounts, IRAs, uh, Roth IRAs, mm -hmm. CDs, you know, just anything that has a value as far as, you know, that you could turn into cash and pay for things, you okay. know, so those types of things, those, those types of statements. Um, you know, life insurance, uh, if you have life insurance policies, right. uh, disability insurance. And usually term insurance is preferable, but people are, uh, they're back to trying to sell permanent policies again. I see the big push on that again yeah, lately, Yeah, it is. Too. It's really becoming a big thing again. And if somebody's trying to sell you permanent life insurance policies, very few situations where whole life or universal life or anything like that actually makes a lot of sense right uh simply because they use it as a savings vehicle but it's a very inefficient savings vehicle right because right. the cost of insurance keeps going up inside the policy as you get older and when is the cost of insurance highest when, when you're older. you are in your retirement years when you're supposed to be using it supposedly as a savings vehicle and if you pull all that money out and it goes away the policy lapses you could have some terrible tax circumstances that befall you for doing that. So right. really, really, uh, you know, that, that'd be something I would avoid like the plague. Uh, sometimes there are situations in estate planning circles. I was going to, that's what I was going to say. Much like any product that's out there, I won't say any product, most products that are mm -hmm. out there, it has a place where it, you know, is useful. Right. Uh, but you can't blanket statement that, hey, this is useful for everyone right, because it's right. not. And, and, you know, one of the things that I do is I I split things up. You know, mm -hmm. you talked about the things to bring in and you brought up life insurance. Well, what would fall in that category for me? Auto insurance, homeowners insurance. You know, and one of the things that uh, I like is having somebody give some guidance on that that doesn't sell the product exactly uh but you know for for the most part i find that most pnc agents property and casualty agents life and uh, you know auto insurance uh tend to be pretty decent at setting these things up sometimes they're they're not they're competing on price right and you got to be really really careful because they may be competing on price to keep the price low but you may be actually missing coverages that would be c tremendously important to you and would cost a little bit more yeah uh, some examples of those things. Yeah. So the other thing would be that what would I'm, be some of those examples of those things before you go on. Oh, okay. Yeah, of, of things that would be important coverages uh, on auto ins auto insurance, oh, yeah. homeowners I mean, insurance, your your liability your coverage. Your you know if you've got a newer car, maybe umbrella coverage. So well, that's that's where I was going up. originally was yeah. that. So if you're if you're 
payout limits aren't high enough, then you've got a bridge gap between that and the umbrella that you're responsible for. Most umbrellas, you know, the the liability starts at about three hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah. And if your coverage, if your auto insurance only goes up to two hundred and fifty thousand, and you're in a severe wreck, and someone, you know, have you is, ever seen that where they didn't automatically coordinate it? I've not seen it where. I, I'll put it this way: a responsible agent would yeah. would. I didn't even think they would issue it, but that's possible. I never even thought about it. It never they, even crossed my they mind. They will issue it, and you would be... Uh, oh, interesting. Yeah, so you'd be like a but, donut hole. I'd never seen that yeah, before. Yeah, I, you won't because most agents won't let you do that right, right, to yeah. yourself. And that's because, typically what happens. Yeah, they'll have a limit of liability under your auto insurance of 250000 uh, 500000 and then the umbrella picks up at that point where that cut leaves off, and it brings you up to a million, and that's the umbrella. Another thing that, um, okay, so you said auto insurance, but homeowner's insurance, I think about schedules. Oh, and yeah. And one of the things I like to point out is that. Mm -hmm. If you have a gun collection, you have a music instrument collection, right. you have a coin collection, you have anything that you have that might be the slightest bit unusual, Make sure that your auto insurance actually covers Home, those your things. Oh, right. What did I say? Auto. <laughs> yeah, I said I'm sorry. Auto. Yeah. yeah. Homeowners insurance. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because most people don't realize that, you know, they think, well, because it's in the house, it's going to be insured. Right. But there's, you know, all these clauses in your insurance policy that, you know, you, you'll have limits on stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, you know, it varies from policy to policy, but you may have, you know, so your wife or your spouse may have some expensive jewelry and mm -hmm. but your policy only covers up to two thousand dollars right know? so you know if you have expensive items like paul was saying you yeah know, thanks for explaining what i meant by schedules yeah <laughs> i wasn't even thinking about yeah. that <laughs> so if you have expensive <laughs> items like paul was saying you know whether it be jewelry yeah. you have um you know music equipment photography equipment uh right. you have a uh, you know woodworking equipment or you well, know sure. expensive yeah. yeah some type of expensive hobby where you've accumulated a lot of stuff that has a lot of value you want to check with your agent and make sure that those items would be covered and if not you want to make sure that you yeah. do get them covered I remember when we got uh, when i got licensed to do property and casualty insurance they were talking about the contents of the house and how do you define that? It says, well, if you're to pick up the house and turn it upside down, whatever would go to the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> that was the way the guy actually <laughs> described it. Oh. Um, but, you know, I thought it was funny. But, yeah, so th those are types of coverages, and, and you're insuring those things against loss, and typically replacement value right. is pretty normal yeah. uh, with those types of things. So you, know, you look at your maybe your musical equipment. You know, maybe I I buy a guitar uh, for a thousand bucks. Oh, sometimes guitars go up in value. I'm trying to think of something. Like, <laughs> you, you got a symbol, let's say. Let's say it's a symbol. If it's if it's a brand new symbol, it might be five hundred dollars. If it's used, it, you might be able to get it for one hundred and fifty bucks. That's a big difference, right? You know, and if you actually lose that that symbol on your drum set and then you want to be able to replace that you're going to have to cough up 500 if you want the same thing that you had otherwise they'll basically give you used price for it so sure. those types of things you got to be really conscious of right yeah uh so yeah. what's the value the replacement value um auto insurance homeowner's insurance uh and then you know what's your deductible on your auto uh you've got two different deductibles sure yeah be conscious of collision comprehensive mm -hmm. right uh, collision, I think of in terms of, you know, you caused the accident. Right. You're at fault. Yep. A comprehensive would be a deer, you know, decides to uh, see if they can leap over your car and doesn't quite make it. Or, yeah, that, that uh, happened to me in November, so. Oh, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> or a hailstorm or, uh, or something like that. Uh, or, you know, you have a tree limb that falls on your car. And yeah. those are things that are not in your control. And having a higher collision deductible, remember, the thing that you are at fault for, uh, has more of an impact on your premium than the comprehensive typically. So yeah. you know, one of those things that you can do is play around with those deductibles. Because uh, if you're looking at going, oh, I can't afford more insur insurance, remember, remember, it's, it's, exactly. a, it's a premium game. I mean, these people are competing on having the lowest premium. You yeah. know, call up this number and you can save whatever percent on your on your auto insurance. Well, you might get cheaper coverage, but the reality of it is you may have a lot of things that aren't covered that really ought to be covered. Yeah. 
you uh, you may have less coverage for lesser price. So, yeah, you know, yeah. That's, so, that's kind so, of the key to it and everything. But so. that replacement cost coverage and those types of things to think about, um, you know, typically I tell people uh, go around your house with a camera. Everybody's got phones now. Go around your house, just walk around and videotape it. Sure. And then stick it in Dropbox or some kind of at a cloud savings area where mm -hmm. you can save video. Right. Uh, because if something ever happens, your house burns down, you want to be able to prove what you owned. Exactly. It's, it's a really good idea. Yeah. Uh, so that uh, medical insurance is another thing. Uh, Social Security has a disability feature. It's very, very limited for most people. So, you know, d you have that. Uh, other types of, of risk management, wills. Making sure that you have wills sure. and, and, yep. and trusts and, and those powers of, attorneys, powers of attorneys, medical directives, you know, all of those things. Yeah. And in the planning process, you want to look at all of those things, because if something happens to you, it's really good to have a planner that knows where everything is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And exactly. then they know where everything is. And, you know, somebody comes in distraught. Number one, they're grieving. They're going through something terribly, terribly difficult and to not know what they've got, where it is where what all of these things mean it can be tremendously challenging so that's another reason that having somebody that really knows of this stuff and having it one place that you can call is uh very very important